Welcome to War of the Weirds, the war between friends where the strength is a discovery, the great attempts of victory. Last time, Burley struck first and delved into the strange delusional world of gang stalking. Mystic would not take such an attack lying down, so he told the story of Yoshi Shiratori, aka the Prison Break Magician. The public cast their vote and Mystic emerged victorious. He may have earned the spoils of war with that victory, but the war rages on with this week's battle. The Terminal Man versus the Toxic Lady. <coughs> Hello and welcome to War of the Weirds. I'm Broomy. And I'm Mystic. And we're here to tell one another and you all the strangest stories we can find about our strange reality yep. that we live in. And, uh, you know, it's very strange. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uh, just like, uh, if... If I wasn't buried in strange news that is also bad, but it's also strange, I don't know. I would be fine. <laughs> I would yeah. be fine <laughs> yeah. if the world was a little less strange. Yeah, it's like, all right, we, we get it. You're, now you're doing, like, your caricature of weirdness. Like, yeah. <laughs> tone it down. Yeah. Yeah, Kanye, you don't need to pee on your Grammy and say, right. I could do this forever. Right, Exactly. Um, while running for president <laughs> yeah. well funny you should bring that up because yeah. uh in lieu of a story this week um for my part of this podcast i'm just telling our listeners to go watch the debate that happened and that's it that's it good night everybody bye well wow you just canceled yeah. my story <laughs> no, uh, i, I don't even get a story yeah no uh, no, that was, that was, I don't know, you know, that was just weird. Like, whatever your, whatever anybody's political stance is, that debate was, uh... I, I didn't watch it. it was because fun. I don't need, I don't need to. <laughs> like, yeah. what am I gonna get convinced yeah. of anything? Uh... <laughs> um, you might get convinced that we're living in a, in a, like, a Truman Show type place. Um, Who's something... Truman in that scenario? Uh, maybe just maybe me, maybe you, maybe just like citizens, you know. I did think the other day, I was thinking about like uh, senses and if we lived in a simulation like in the Matrix. But like what if, what if this simulation that we're in, these like the bodies that we inhabit are not the actual bodies that we, like the dimensions and everything like this, like the... Um, like all of our senses and stuff, that's all that's all just part of the simulation. And really we're like five dimensional beings with tentacles and no eyes or something like that. But wait, what do you mean really? If it's a simulation, what well, like, are you talking no, like about? the original are bodies that are plugged into the simulation. Going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the Matrix. Like the Matrix, you know? Okay. Like they have you're the saying, bodies but they're yeah. plugged in. But like okay. what if the bodies that are actually plugged in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not I a weird story, but I was just thinking about that this week. Yeah, I mean, uh, also, oh, go, yeah. ahead. go ahead. No, I, I don't know. I didn't have any spe specific thing to say. Yeah, I was just thinking you were talking about like just a computer program because that's uh, what people think. Yeah. It like a lot of scientists, not a lot, but right, right, a certain sect that are actively thinking about this think that it is more than likely that we are currently within a computer simulation. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is like what I'm getting at. Like, what if it's, what if it's, it is, but like, Oh, like we're constructed. <laughs> but you want to have tentacles. It's the point here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of what course. if it yeah, is, but would? like, I mean, hentai, you know? Yeah. What if I so, had a beak and eight tentacles? Yeah. Are you saying the number cool. eight tentacles or if you ate tentacles? I'm saying like the number. Dinner. Uh, speaking of tentacles and a beak, I learned this week that squids' brains are donut shaped, and their throat goes through it. Hell yeah! <laughs> so I I don't know I don't know how to respond to that. I I was gonna say delicious. Uh, yeah, well, if they but... eat something too big, it, it can get brain damage. Wow. 
Yeah. That's and the, the people. <laughs> that's a funny that, problem to have. Yeah, the the people I heard uh, making the tell, like they're telling this. I was on the uh, Nate Bargatze's podcast, mm-hmm. uh, and they were like, "Yeah, they're like you just eat something so big you can't even wrap your mind around it." And I thought that was very funny. Yeah, yeah, uh, but he is a f- professional comedian, so that's you know. But um, and then last, <laughs> that's to be last... expected and not applauded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you it's will part reach of the course. Bare Don't... minimum of being funny. Yeah. Yeah, if you yeah, expect don't, don't anything congratulate from me. him on that. <laughs> um, but also, I heard on NPR this week they were talking about QAnon, and I was like, I know what that is, and I impressed the people around me because they were like, "What's that?" And I was like, "Well, <laughs> uh, yeah." yeah. Actually, actually, I was gonna mention that uh, that I read up on it more, mm-hmm. and uh, it's uh, worse than <laughs> I was saying, <laughs> which I was oh, saying yeah. it was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was working off of information from like a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. And they just had uh, a new new drop. And yeah, just it's horrible and legit dangerous that so many people believe this. Yeah. Also a lot more anti-Semitism. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is, I just don't get that. Like, I, I don't, I don't know why that's a thing. Uh, it's. It's been a thing for a while. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know why. Like, I don't know, like, what, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just they're they're the other, number one. And right, then, right. Uh, there are a decent amount of powerful Jewish people. So yeah. they connect those dots. Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, they aren't right. the it's other reaching, to but me. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, not Jewish, but I right. don't consider them the other. We're we're uh, Gentiles over here, but uh, <laughs> we we are not we are you know no no uh, anti-Semitic feelings. <laughs> Did you say anti-Semitic? I said anti. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just uh, no. You're just getting got, over got the tentacles. tentacles on the brain, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I hope that never happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> you hope you never get over it, or you hope no, hentai no. never happens hope, to you. I hope that uh, tentacles never grab. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you wouldn't want that, but you know, teach his own. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, oh man, oh, I was thinking <clears throat> maybe. The, I mean, uh, you know, there's you. You don't have an answer for this because nobody does. But uh i know like in i think it's i don't know if it's in the uk or somewhere I, I, or maybe i don't know some european country i believe um where they are very close supposedly to a vaccine for covid19 and they're talking about how like they're discussing now and their government like if they should make it mandatory that people get this and then like you know i've been i've been here you hear arguments that are like well like we gotta protest this because like what it like if the government can tell us to get vaccines and what if they like they say that we all have to be like sterilized or something like that mm-hmm. but it's like and like i'm not i'm not saying like one way or the other like my my i'm not like i have no i'm not stating an opinion about this because it's like a very complex issue yeah. but my what i thought was like i mean that then that's when you protest like if, if you're like if it gets to something that outrageous well, it's just like like if you yeah. if like if I don't know if you like if you're against it on principle, then that that's one thing to like that's one thing, and people you know that's a that's an opinion that people can back up. Mm-hmm. But uh, but like yeah, like they always be like, well, if they do this, then they can tell us that we all have to chop a hand off. Be like, all right, yeah. well, I mean, that's when you would protest like that. I mean, that's like if if you're doing it strictly. Yeah, it's just a matter of like what. Like where do you draw the line? What, yeah, no, it's like what is what are they putting in place to make it mandatory? Oh, is the question. yeah, 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 yeah. Because if yeah. they put a law that is a little right. broader than just yeah. this specific vaccine, then that might be bad. Uh, if the government is corrupt per se, you know. Yeah, right, or right, right. Has that's that's valid. weird motivations. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting a call. Silence that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I see what you're saying. And that is a complex issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that that opinion is wrong or that it's simple. I'm just saying like with, with the examples they give. Yeah. That's what I'm like. All right. But 
that's you see how that's different like cutting off a limb <laughs> but yeah you're right you're right with the with the like the legislation things that would have to go into place but uh yeah <clears throat> uh um so i hear mainly because it's the it's the premise of the podcast that you have a strange story to tell i do i do um yeah um so i'm debating about whether or not like when to drop the shoe like you like when you know you know when when to it, it probably <clears throat> depends when you're gonna leave the house um yeah yeah so gotta drop it to put it drop it i don't don't wear them but you know if i wore them i'd drop one put it on I oh, wouldn't yeah. be carrying it around and just be dropped already by the door. Yeah, you don't. I just pick it up only, and drop it again. <laughs> that's the only reason you own shoes is it's to, to yeah. drop them. Right. Exactly. And then drop. You know, when the other shoe drops, I'll wait for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. Nobody seems to care about that initial shoe. <laughs> no, no. They only just want to. They only want the the other shoe. You know. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. <clears throat> Story is about Maran Karimi Nasseri. Mm. You familiar? You might have uh, actually heard of this guy. Uh, unfortunate that the name is so close to Moron, but yeah, uh, <laughs> he is. He's also known as Sir Alfred. Have you heard of him? Uh, I, I, yeah, Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir Alfred. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how I'm going to address him, Moran Nasseri aka sir alfred mm-hmm. um so i have uh, not know. heard of this yeah. uh, okay i i think when i start to get into it you will have like heard about this or read about this or perhaps seen some popular culture uh, that it inspired but um he arrived at the charles de gaulle airport in on august 26th 1988 okay mm-hmm at the time he was in his early 40s he was heading to the uk this is his story this is what he says happened He was heading to the uk to meet up with his biological mother for the first time ever he flew from paris to the heathrow airport in london this this is like this is factual like the the reason for traveling is what he said but the factual what we have as fact is uh he flew from paris to heathrow airport in london but he did not have any identification on him, no passport or anything. Um, he said that they had been stolen. So, I know what this story is. I watched yes. a twenty-some yeah. minute documentary on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I figured this. I, like I was like confident you had heard of this. Yeah. Um, so I'll start. So like uh, you know, uh, I'll just go ahead and drop, you know, let, let the shoe drop uh, early and then get into some more backstory. So when he, when he landed, uh, in Heathrow airport, he had no documentation, so they couldn't let him into the country. So they sent him back to Paris. When he landed there, he was arrested for attempted unlawful entry into France. But since it was a liminal space, AKA the airport terminal, wasn't a destination, rather it was a, a threshold halfway between coming and going. He got off on a technicality. He couldn't, however, exit the airport and officially enter Paris. Um, so it was determined he was free to remain at the terminal and was he was responsible for obtaining his documentation. So he settled down in Terminal 1. That was the hub of the airport. Restaurants, bars, stores, all that stuff. Uh, found a comfortable bench. It was a little cushioned red bench. And uh, spread his jacket on it and uh, settled down. And he lived there for 18 years. Yeah. That's crazy. And his name? Tom Hanks. Yeah. <laughs> so he did, uh, <laughs> if you saw like the terminal and then like, I think there's a book called Terminal Man. And then there's like mm. all these weird indie films about it. And there's even like a comedy in like, I think in France or something, or uh, maybe in, I think it's in France. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was like a com- like a comedy, like a sitcom uh, about it or like, you know, the character inspired by him but yeah lived in this airport for 18 years um he survived all the kindness of strangers airport staff you know befriended him if you're there i mean you're there for for 18 years you you get to know the staff you get to know people like uh yeah 
Yeah. So, um, by the yeah. way, I, I'm not going to give anything away, but yeah. having seen the terminal and then watching very recently watching a shorter documentary on this, uh, the real story is so much more interesting. Than the yeah. Terminal, yeah. See, I have kind of boring movie. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen the terminal. So at the end of this, whether you, like after, after like I recount this, this story, uh, I would be glad to hear like what the terminal is about, like a quick summary or like, you know, we could obviously talk after we record, but I, I'm definitely down to hear, hear about that. Cause I have no, I guess I, obviously I read about things like that and some of the other things that it inspired, but I didn't like read the, the plot. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very interested to hear that. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's probably fine for like, I think it'd be fine to share if you're okay with that because uh like the, you know, listeners would like might be f- more familiar with that blockbuster. I don't know if it was a blockbuster or not, but anyways. Um, so yeah, he he lived it f- uh, for eighteen years. Um, he got free meals from McDonald's. Uh, that was you know in the airport. Some of the employees would give him free meals. Um, people would like sit and talk to him. I mean, he became like a local celebrity after a while, and so people would like donate you know money, toiletries, food, meal vouchers you know things to keep him in hygiene um they uh he would just like sit and talk to people like even if they didn't know who he was they just you know he would strike up a conversation and people would find out about his plight and they would you know give him some money or a jacket or whatever um yeah. so he had had things that he needed you know just showered like i mean he used like the the bathroom to to stay clean and everything um he did he 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 did get some money there was, was donated and he would buy whatever he needed from the shops and um, and whatnot, and then put the rest in a savings account that he opened with uh, with the airport's post office. And he yeah. just and he just read. He just read newspapers and journals all the time. Which that like I want to I want to I don't really have anything to say, but I would love to talk about or just sit and like think about. Can you imagine? Because this was so this was 1988. He lived there for 18 years. So the the technological advancements that he like the the nation's change everything changing yeah and he's just from seeing the perspective it perspective of just an airport yeah you're just like seeing like the electronic shop change and get updated or you're seeing people come in with laptops or cell phones like you just notice it in the population like you don't that it's so that's wild i mean he's reading he's yeah. reading you know newspapers and things so he's keeping up on current, current events but like or at least I don't mean I don't, you know I don't know which newspapers he's reading whether they're local but I'm sure they include national and international news that's that's huge. But yeah, just it, he's he, he the window he chose to set up had like a view of a fountain. Yeah, it is a very weird situation because it's also uh, he's isolated, right? Yeah, but he's surrounded right. by people constantly. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a weird mixed bag because obviously on some level he's isolated in experience because right. this type of thing has happened to other people, but not yeah. in that airport. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's gets harder and harder to relate to people over yeah. the, yeah. I, what do you have to talk how about? Many years. Uh, yeah. And, That's... uh, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy um but i will i'll tell a little bit more because the situation does get a little i mean that's that's obviously like the super weird but the story does have some more some more twists and turns um yeah. so um after after a year of living there he had saved up enough money to buy another ticket to heathrow airport he's going to london so he did that despite still not having any id he was like, I'll test my luck. Maybe I can, you know, things have loosened up or that's on the off chance I can get through. So same thing happened. He got there, was returned to Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris. He was there. He was arrested there and the government tried to deport him, but there was no like country of origin or co- like birth country on any documents. So they couldn't do anything with him. Uh, and so he just remained at the airport. So mm. here's his story. Here's, um, when he's interviewed, this is what he says happens. 
happened. Uh, his father was a doctor that worked for an oil company. He had five brothers and sisters. And when his father died, his mother told him that he was actually the product of an affair and not her biological child. Um, his real Can mother. Can I stop here? Yeah. Elizabeth? Yeah. It's just a funny idea. Like, I don't know. A doctor that works for an oil company yeah. is a, like a weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's a weird phrase so like these huge oil companies you know they'll have like they have like doctors on call they have like especially if it's like a drilling site they they have like you know oh um, so it's like on like he's the medic on yeah, site yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 not just like he he died <laughs> yeah good call good stuff there um yeah so yeah he said he worked for uh, this giant uh oil company and was just you know just one of their their resident doctors that was like on site or um yeah um and uh yeah so uh the reason that family kept his birth a secret is that because of the time in iran adultery was a capital offense and so you know they hid the fact that his father had an affair with a scottish nurse um he uh, yeah, so he decided, uh, like when that when that came out, he was shunned by his family, and he uh, he went to England for a while. Uh, he was he had he had a college degree, he had a college education. So in England, he was taking graduate courses in like economics and stuff, and lived on money from his quote unquote mother, the woman that raised him. Um, she would just send him kind of like a stipend. And he became in pro- involved in protest in England and uh, political demonstrations. And after two years, the money stopped coming. So he had no choice but to go home back to Iran. And when he did, he was arrested by a secret police force that produced evidence showing that some of the protests that he had been involved in were against the Iranian Shah, which is the ruling monarch. Um, he was tortured and expelled from Iran. And this was fortunately was granted refugee status by the United Nations Committee on Human Rights. And they also provided him with travel documents that allowed him to travel throughout countries that had signed the Geneva Convention. Um, this, he's traveling. He's on a subway when he got mugged, and his briefcase was stolen, which contained all of his documents. So that's what he said happened. Yeah, that's a lot. It's also... It's also you know not... It, you know what's fishy about it is the sort of, like, uh, the how long was he away from Iran? Uh, two years. Two years. So in two years, he comes back and he gets arrested by secret police because yep. he was protesting. Right. It seems that seems weird. And then, like you know, I know there are oppressive governments. Oh in, yeah, that yeah. do that type of thing. Yeah. But it's you know why is he a high priority? Um, right. And then there's uh. There's the idea of the, the the him also being a target for getting papers by the a very like United Nations what yeah yeah United Nations Committee of Human Rights yeah I mean it, they should get on this case where he's stuck in the airport an airport yeah <laughs> <laughs> like he uh, got those papers <laughs> let's let's go yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, his, his, his mother, his Iranian mother was tracked down eventually and she's like, yeah, no, that's my son. Like the whole family's like, yeah, this is, this is really our, he's related to us by blood. Like, look at him. He doesn't look like he's a mix of anything. Like he's, mm-hmm. he was never abandoned, never shunned, you know, never just, he just was like left and became like a nomad and traveled around and uh people found out that he was not his he said you know he was mugged and his documents were stolen that's not what happened what happened was that he had posted them or mailed them if you're not from the uk um mailed them to brussels while on a ferry bound for britain you're not from the uk (laughs) (laughs) right Uh, right you know, but keep okay. it keep the intrigue. You know, people don't. All right, they don't. Not everybody knows that. So, oh, I will say just randomly, um, there's a streamer that I watch, and that she, I don't know like who she confused me with or what, but like, 
for for like I was pretty active in stream for a while and then like went away and came back. Uh, and when I came back, she was just like, "Oh, hey, I forget. Like, hey, how are you? Like, and then she was like, "Hello," and so started talking in an accent. And people were like, "What are you doing?" And she's like, "Oh, yeah, he's from he's from England." And so she just I don't know where she got that from, who she thought I was, but to this yeah. day she thinks that I'm from England. <laughs> also, like that's people from England don't understand Americans unless oh, yeah. they do a British accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she just I don't know, but anyways, uh, so maybe I am. Um, yeah, so he he mailed them to Brussels while on a ferry bound for Britain, and like just because he has made an idiot mistake. And then, then he didn't have his documents, and he never admitted that. So where, where does that information come from? By the way, this comes from the documentary. The Sunday Times was this source. Yeah. This is a quote in the Sunday Times, uh, yeah. in the, from this documentary. I just I don't have the references up right now. Um, no, like for where, like fine. what, which Sunday Times? But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just curious, like. That that's not like his mother saying that because that's like oh very right hyper specific yeah yeah detail. no they yeah so um, so they yeah because my first thought when I was first like listening to these things and reading these things was like oh well his mother it might be afraid like I mean might be afraid of like if it's you know adultery is a capital offense then like she she's lived with that fear for so long um no they found his documents they found mm-hmm. his documents uh but. Some some things had happened in the meantime. So mm-hmm. Maran Karimi and Asiri had gotten a letter, and a, a, some bureaucrat that had sent him a letter because, like, about his plight, had referred to him as Sir Alfred, uh, Sir Alfred Maran, and then he just like went with that, and he like identified as that, and he that's how he introduced himself as Sir Alfred, and he became like took on that persona. And so when they presented those, the documents to him saying like, oh, these are your documents that you sent to Brussels, right? And he's like, no, it's got the wrong name on it because I'm Sir Alfred and this is Maran Karimi Nasiri. And they're like, yeah. but these are like legal documents. He goes, yeah, but they must be forgeries. And then just didn't admit that that was him and lived in an airport for 18 years. Yeah. Um. Uh, but, okay, so... uh. Mother, his mother said that like, you know, this, this did not, none of the birth things was true. Like he just went out on his own. Uh, when he, he did return to Iran and was detained. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, not even, not even returned. When he was in Iran, he was detained, uh, by authorities for potentially participating in anti-Shah demonstrations at the, uh, Tehran university in Iran, which, Mm -hmm. and then they were like, all right, well, you know, they just, like, released him. They No torture. They didn't expel him from the country. They didn't confiscate any documents or, you know, revoke citizenship or anything like that. But they did detain him because, you know, he was, like, protesting against the government at the time. They, like, you know, investigated that. But then let him go. Just, like, you know. Uh, uh, so, anyways. So all that, he, he, he just, like, he chose to remain there, basically. So in 1992, uh, his he got a... a a lawyer, a French human rights lawyer, Christian Bourget, um, like took up his plight, and a court ruled that although he entered legally to this the country, uh, he couldn't be expelled from the airport because, like, it, the way he entered the country without his documents, he didn't have permission to enter France. Hmm. So, people they tried to get new documents from him. And uh, issued from Belgium, which they had his, they had the the documents, uh, and they wanted like, they were like, we'll reissue these documents with what this name that you want to be called, if like you're not you're not accepting the ones we're giving you, we'll reissue new ones. <laughs> I mean, like you honestly, can legally change your name. At this point, it's like, I, I it feels odd because I'm conflicted at this point because it's like. Yeah. I don't know. You kind of you should make him just say, "This is my name," and yeah, I I have done all of this effort to get you these papers so you can get out of here. But now you're and, saying yeah. this fake name is your name. Yeah. Come on, yeah. 
Obviously, uh, he has some sort of issues. Yes, but, yes. So, but beyond that, it's like, come on. Yeah, it's 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 like there. It has been determined that he has some kind of pathology, as it's called. Um, people don't really know what or why, but um, like he he loved the attention he was getting um, as Sir Alfred. And, uh, you know, the, the articles and people, when the people came to make documentaries about him, he was like, just like natural in front of the camera and like, so at ease. Um, and he actually, in 1991, some family and friends visited. They, I mean, they knew he, like they had heard about it and found out. And so they went to visit him and try to like get him to like, you know, ad- admit that he was what the papers say he is. And so that he can like leave the airport and he pretended to not know them. He's talked, he acted like they were complete strangers. And they're like, you're my family. Like, I literally were related. I grew up with you. Like, yeah. and he, he wouldn't admit, he never admitted it. Um, so in 1995, uh, Belgium granted him permission to travel to Belgium, but he had to be, like, under the supervision of a social worker. And so that he could, like, get his papers, get everything straightened out. And then Nasseri or Moran or, sorry, Alfred, whatever you want to call him, refused because he wanted to enter the UK or like he like through London like he had planned under and and also under the name Sir Alfred. So at this point it's just stubbornness. He's like he's like, "Oh, I can come to Belgium. Well, I actually want to go to London first. Like that's how I yeah. plan to and they're like, well, It's like, "Well, what the uh, fuck?" Well, yeah. Like, well, <laughs> like, we're going to we're going to provide you like a flight like you can um later after this France and Belgium offered him residency, but he yeah. would not sign the papers because they listed him as being Iranian, and he mm-hmm. want he in, like kept insisting at this point that he was British, um, yeah. and that his name Oops. should be Sir Alfred Moran, and not uh, not Moran Karimi Nasiri like it's listed on these papers that would grant him residency. Yeah. And his lawyer was like, "Dude, what? He was, I, you're. He was infuriated. He was so frustrated. Uh, I mean, he had worked. This was three years. This guy took up his plight in '92, and then after 1995, they're like, all right, you know what? You can just fine. Be. You can live here. It's okay.' And then he's like, "Nope, because you didn't call me what I want to be called." And the, then his yeah. lawyer's like, "Are you? You? I, I've been interacting with Not multiple only that, countries. But I don't want to live here. I want to go to London." Or He's like, I, "I have been interacting with multiple countries on your behalf. Do you know how hard it is to get the attention of two countries?" Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so his family, they were like, "He just he's living the life he wants. That's that's what they said. They said that they believed he was living the life that he wanted. That's a quote." Yeah. Um, and so he remained in the airport, um, until July, 2006, when he was hospitalized. Um, that's, yeah. Um. What, what, <laughs> what is your hesitance? I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking about this. I'm just thinking about. Yeah, um, he was hospitalized, and then when he was while he was gone, his sitting place was dismantled. So all of his, you know, he had kind of like things he had accumulated, and also like I'm yeah, sure they probably wanted to update the, the furniture. Yeah, um, he left the hospital uh, in 2007, and um, the still under the protection of the airport, uh, the airport's branch of the Red Cross uh, took care took care of him. And gave him a. Uh, they they like lodged him uh, in a in a hotel very close to the airport. Two months after that, he was uh, transferred to a charity, and he's continued to live in a shelter ever since. Mm. Um. And he's still alive. Still alive. Still alive. Cool. Lives in a shelter in France. Um. Yeah. Uh, he is, he is 74 now. Um, if you look on his Wikipedia page, it says citizenship, Iranian from 1946 through 1977 
and stateless 1977 through present. Mm. So a stateless person is someone who is not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. Um, yeah. So I, it like, I mean, whatever the, so some of those family just going into like some possible explanations here, some of those families suggested that like, perhaps he was like ashamed of the life or like what he had become. And that's why he pre- like pretended to not to recognize them. Um, and that like, yeah, I mean, he was like s- supposedly a promising, like very educated young man. Um, his doctor, I mean, his father was actually a doctor. Um, yeah, but, uh, my, my take on it is that like basically, so in the beginning, it was a legitimate issue. Right. right? Yeah. He did not have his documents. So, yeah. So he was stuck at the airport. And right. I think he just got used to that life and it became his normal. Yeah. And his yeah. comfort place. Yeah. So when you're in this normal that is in no way normal <laughs> and you're. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're comforted by the idea that you're British and Sir Alfred as well. You don't want any of those things to go away, even though you are uh, limiting your life right, very right. much. Yeah, you might have a like, have better circumstances, but the this like the psychological appeal of where you are and what and who you are uh, could outweigh that. Another inconvenient truth. Um, yeah reference to previous episode nice. uh, um um yeah and so he whether it was like whatever his reason like what what gets me is though that he he, he knew that his papers where, where his papers were and people like the the general like, like accepted assumption is that he was just ashamed that he like made a dumb mistake and like sent them somewhere else and like, but mm-hmm. I can't believe that like uh, his pride or anybody's pride would like, like, cause I understand once you're in that situation and you, you're in that situation for a while, but like within the first like few days, don't you think you'd be like, all right, well, I, I just need to contact these authorities or like figure out what to do. But like, he didn't even, he was just like, no, this is, this is my story. Like, I don't know where his story came from. Like what, like his, his, the story that he told. Uh, yeah. you know if it just if he really believes that or um yeah. well it was a thing where right like people were reporting on him as it was going on oh yeah yeah so he be he literally like he got press he wasn't just like a super local celebrity right right uh, he got press around so yeah. he there's I guess a that mythology could very quickly, around him yeah and snared him into that, that he wanted to keep going yeah i imagine yeah yeah i'm sure like the second he was like like the the first day where he's like i can't leave this or like that was yeah that became a thing uh yeah i i also i think too um see this is i mean so something that is like something about me and my personality i'm very introverted i'm not shy like I, i'm very out i mean i'm, I'm I'm very like I, I can I'm, I can be social like I, I'm not I'm not shy or or nobody's awkward. accusing you of <laughs> but uh, no but I'm saying like people like people are yeah. often people that know me in real life are very like when like they discover or I say that I'm introverted they're always like but you're like what are you talking about like because I, I can carry on a conversation I'm not like socially awkward but I, I do have to like retreat and take time to recharge and like going out on like doing you know, big social events are very draining for me but one thing yeah. that I think is very fun. There are, I call them, I call them low stakes interactions. So like at the airport or like talking to a cashier or like going on a walk and meeting somebody like, you know, passing someone on the street. Like I love those interactions. I will like talk to people and engage and like, you know, just like try to charm people like, you know, just because like, but then when it comes to like, all right, now like a bunch of your friends are going to come over and hang out and like, oh, okay. But like, cause those, those interactions are there. Like if I can be a complete idiot and talk to whoever and like, there's nothing, there's no anxiety related to that for me. Yeah. That's weird. 
Yeah, I know it's, it's weird. weird. Yeah, no, it's no, not no, weird. It's, it's it, fine. it makes sense. I'm the yeah. opposite, is what I'm saying. Oh, but I wouldn't yeah. consider myself an extrovert. Yeah, uh, yeah. A bunch of friends coming over, I'm comfortable and I'm happy. Yeah, whatever. But uh, I'm talking to a cashier. You 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 think of it like it's it's a one off thing, or maybe yeah. I'll see him again. But yeah. it's not important. Right. And I agree, it's not important. But it's just a sort of like, why why do I even have to have this interaction? Right. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. A, yeah. Like, not that I dislike a cashier per se. Right. It's just like, I don't know what the thing is to say in that situation, even though I've been in it a million times. Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm in different moods when I'm doing yeah. it. A lot of yeah. times I just want to get the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's and fair. Yeah. I don't think about a cashier, even though... I have been a cashier yeah. uh, in my life and I like, I don't think about a cashier in that. Like I'm never rude to a cashier. Right, 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 right. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I know what it's like. Right. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one example in particular, like, the place we got uh, food from tonight, actually the very first time we went there, the lady at the window, it's just like you go up and order and then, you know, uh, step aside and then they'll like come out the other door. Um, but the first time I went there, the lady that took my order, she was in such a bad mood. She was she like wouldn't look at me. She was very like exasperated. And then by the end of the time, by by the time that like I like paid, she was laughing and like she like would, was we were just like cutting up and carrying on. And my girlfriend was like, "You're just, like, what? How are how is this possible that you can like?" completely win her over but yet like when we're like hanging out with a group of people that you know well you're just like all right now i gotta like go in my room for for like the rest of the night and i was just like because this is there's no there's no there's it's no stakes you know there's no if she's i'm not gonna lose anything like i don't have to like constantly be like what do these people think about me because like she well, there's no she already the doesn't think about me is true for me yeah it's like these people that you know yeah that are your friends uh you know you you just gotta know that they like you yeah so yeah. even if you make a dumb mistake I, it's probably not gonna hurt the relationship yeah uh, unless it's really like a real line cross which you right. know you're probably not gonna do right yeah um but so yeah that's that's, that's that's valid and i guess like complete strangers like it gives me a chance to like be a little bit weird or sometimes i create these like personas that I'll like, all right, so that like for the re- like every time I interact with a person, I'm gonna like act like I'm gonna like embrace this persona, whether it's like somebody mm-hmm. like really like obnoxiously like you know like well well actually that's not that's not entirely accurate because or, like just you know but, like so those are like fun little games I play. Anyways, <laughs> the point of me saying all this fun little games I play with these <laughs> waitresses. Is, the point of me sharing they all this information. They need not know the true me. <laughs> The point of me saying all this is that, like, existing, living in an airport is, that is, like, I mean, I'm not saying, like, this is a dream of mine, but I can 100% get on board. Like, if I, if I was stuck, like, I don't want to become stuck, but if I was stuck, I think I would thrive pretty well because every single interaction is transient. Like, you're just, like, you're, you, every interaction is just, there's no stakes. You're never going to see them again. I mean, the people, like, that work there, it's fine, but uh yeah you can just like you meet all kinds of inc- weird people you see different things but i also have to think like everyone kind of feel in liminal spaces everyone kind of feels out of place like you're like looking around because you feel or especially at least i do like i don't i don't i haven't, I haven't flown very much so every time at an airport yeah. i'm looking around and like i feel like people are like annoyed at me or they know that like i'm not i'm not used to this and so they're just like uh you know not walking on this moving sidewalk what are you doing or just just <laughs> yeah. you know and like I, I feel like but in those spaces if you live there and you're like an authority in that situation that's like a power trip like if you're <laughs> yeah. like i belong here what are you doing like i know what's yeah that's i don't know yes anyways <laughs> i don't want to become stuck in an airport an airport but well uh, it's i already i already had the monkey's paw up to the no! up to the headphones so uh you're fucked uh, yeah um yeah uh, I would like to hear about the Terminal Man. I don't know if you want to take a quick break and just, or if you want to give me like a synopsis. I mean, obviously you don't have to at all. Uh, like I can look it I up. I don't. 
You know, I don't remember it that well. Okay. Honestly. Well, then uh, I'll just say that uh, in in 2004, uh, he was uh, approached uh, by, or 2003, sorry, Stilberg and DreamWorks paid him $250,000 for the rights of his story. Um, but ultimately did not use his story in the film, the terminal, but that was like, that was like the, the impetus for creating that movie was like, we're going to make a movie about this. So 2004 yes. it was a Tom Hanks movie came out called the terminal. Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it was 2004, but the, in 2004, the book, the terminal man was published. It was his autobiography. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. The terminal was in. Uh, yeah, the terminal was in. Two thousand four. And yeah. he's he actually oh it says that uh, the uh, the Guardian indicates that he carried a poster of the of the film uh, draped over his suitcase. Until he mm. was uh, until he was taken from the hospital. Are taken from the airport to the hospital. Yeah, hmm. yeah. The it's it's a thing where what they did with the terminal was kind of they took out all the weird stuff at the end there. Oh yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think it was really just about a guy who was stuck at a terminal. Yeah, and weird. had to deal with it. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, whereas the more interesting stuff to me of the story is the stuff where it's like. Well, he's kind of refusing. Yeah, help. he could have gotten out of it, but yeah, yeah. Also, there was a an opera. Uh, he was the inspiration for an opera called "Flight" by Jonathan Dove, um, which I don't know how you make an opera about this, <laughs> but that I think that's I'm a. Stuck. <laughs> I think that's a like a dream of mine, like a like a, a legacy that I want. Because I want to, I told you before, I want to have something so weird that I would end up on a show like this, but that I inspire an opera. Because like, what in the like? Yeah, I don't. That just seems. Like, I don't even understand what the opera would be because it's not like, it's not that dramatic. Yeah. Of a story, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas opera, to me, <laughs> my impression of opera is that it's hugely dramatic. <laughs> there is a lot of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I don't think this story is extremely emotional. No. You know? No. Um, perhaps for my uh, for one of the the spoils of war. Um, if I, if I get it next time I get it, we'll be making you watch this opera. <laughs> uh, oh, or maybe I could at least sure. do a uh, the um, collateral damage episode of talking about the opera. Sure, but uh, mean, yeah, if you win, maybe that will happen. Yeah, all right. Well, I uh, guess we'll take a little break, and uh, yeah. we're gonna have a we have a sponsor here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. This episode of War of the Weird is brought to you by the concept of a dancing koala. My, what a delightful thought! All you must do to enjoy such a ponderance is go over to dancingkoala.gov and use the code WEIRDWAR to receive 15% off all Dancing Koala considerations. Now back to the show. And we're back. Um, for, before we get into my story, I wanted to mention that the, uh, the documentary... <clears throat> was a YouTube video uh, by the same person who did the where I found out about Nasubi, the the uh, man that was on the reality show, yeah. uh, for like a year where he was naked and had to uh, yeah. enter contests yeah. <laughs> to get things like food. Um, so uh, it was atrocity guide. Mm. Uh, you can see some footage of this guy reading his newspaper and talking to the documentary cameras, that type of thing. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I'll post, uh, I'll post uh, the link to the video in the discord. Yes. Uh, when this, um, when this posts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let, let's get into my story. Yeah. It takes place in an airport terminal. And this guy's name is Sir Alfred. <laughs> that's what he wants to be called. Yeah. Uh, 
February 19th, 1994. Oh, wow. I was a couple days old. Yeah. As you were a tiny little baby. Yeah. Uh, Gloria, Rami- oh, Gloria Ramirez, mm-hmm. a 31-year-old woman with late-stage cervical cancer, is rushed to General Hospital in Riverside, California. Is that, just real quick, is this the General Hospital that Soap Opera is about? Yes. Oh, sweet. Um, Sunny. <laughs> Sunny's the best. I, I do not know a single character. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. Was George Clooney on that one? Or uh, was it I, a different I think one? he was on Days of Our Lives. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so she's rushed to the hospital. She had a rapid, rapid heartbeat, a drop in blood pressure. She could hardly breathe, and she couldn't form coherent sentences to explain what was going on. Drugs. Uh, sure. <laughs> the doctors and nurses immediately rushed to try and save her life. And they injected her with drugs, mm. uh, aforementioned, uh, to bring her vital signs to normal, and that didn't work. Which they expected it to. Yeah. Uh, nurses removed Gloria's shirt to apply defibrillator electrodes. Right. So the like the little black, uh, you know, things that you stick on to use a defibrillator or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and they noticed an oily sheen and shine on her body. So her, like, skin is very oily. Mm -hmm. Uh, They also smelled a fruity, garlicky smell coming from her mouth. Nurses put a syringe in her arm to get a blood sample, and her blood smelled like ammonia. Hmm. That sounds a little bit familiar, but I, I I can't recall it. Uh, you might have heard this story. And there were beige particles floating in her blood. Mm-hmm. So the doctor who was in charge of the ER was like, yep, that's fucked up. <laughs> uh, he went to uh, medical school good. for that diagnosis? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it seems here you got a case of the, oh, shit, no. <laughs> uh so then one of the nurses attending to Gloria started to faint. Another started having trouble breathing. Mm. And another nurse passed out. Mm-hmm. When that nurse woke up, she couldn't move her arms and legs. Six people couldn't help to treat Gloria Ramirez because something was affecting them and giving them intense symptoms. Like fainting, shortness yeah. of breath, nausea. Paralysis, yeah. temporary paralysis. And uh, Gloria Ramirez died that night. They got a special team in hazmat students mm-hmm. to handle the body. The team searched the ER for any signs of poison gas or toxins, anything that could have caused this, and they didn't find anything to explain it. So... Uh, it's like, why, what? Yeah. <laughs> Her blood smells like ammonia. There are beige particles in it. Uh, fucking fruit garlic. Fruity garlic in her mouth yeah. coming out of it. And a, covered in an oily sheen. I think the, she probably ate something really garlicky and then tried to chew some like juicy fruit to disguise the flavor because maybe she was going to be kissing on somebody. I think you cracked the case. Uh, Thank you. you. And I didn't even go to medical school. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously you're not as smart as the doctor that I was talking about. Yeah, he was was a pretty apt diagnosis. So 23 of 37 hospital staff fell ill. Whoa. Five of them being hospitalized themselves. Mm. One nurse threw up and said her skin was burning. 
She t spent 10 days in the hospital suffering from apnea. Apnea being troubled breathing. Yeah. Another spent uh, two weeks in intensive care with hepatitis and avascular necrosis in her knees. That's so her her veins are rotting. Uh, specifically, her uh, the bone tissue. Oh, uh, doesn't get enough blood, and the bone tissue starts to die. Oh, so so it's a plague. The hazmat or... crew. What? Oh, it's like a new plague, or Moses is coming back, or is this a Moses situation? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the animals, and then uh, the animals on the boat. Oh no, that's that's, that's Noah. Noah. That's Noah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I got my uh, biblical figures mixed up. Yeah. Come uh, on. Jesus betrayed Judas, right? <laughs> Something like anyway. that. Yeah. The hazmat crew put the body in a sealed aluminum casket. Okay, so she died. She's dead. Okay. Yes. The not the not the <laughs> woman with the knee problem. Right, right, but, but the Gloria Ramirez. Ramirez, yeah. Did they uh, did they do an autopsy or were they just like we gotta like conceal this and like I mean like close her up and like <laughs> no, they did oh, okay. uh, a week later. Okay. They did an autopsy okay. in a special room. The autopsy crew were wearing hazmat suits. The the press uh, heard the story and uh, dubbed her the toxic lady. Oh, or the toxic woman, right? Uh, because if you were around her, you might pass out, get paralyzed, or whatever. It's a very bad superpower. Uh, She's like Rogue from X Men, but she doesn't have to touch you. Yeah. So like, uh, aggressive Rogue. Yeah. I was trying to think Airborne like rogue. of a word yeah. that inter <laughs> intersects those two uh, things. Yeah. I couldn't think of one. Yeah. Um, uh, Rouge. Uh, <laughs> three autopsies were done on. Wow. Her. March twenty fourth. Uh, more than a month later, a very thorough autopsy was done. Uh, apparently, there were signs of Tylenol, lidocaine, codeine, and Tigan in her system. I know, uh, I know what some of those things are, but not the last one. Uh, Tigan is an anti-nausea medication, and it breaks down uh, into amines, amines mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, the body. Yeah. And amines are related to ammonia. Okay, yeah. They're like a part of ammonia yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, which maybe explains the ammonia smell in her blood. Mm -hmm. So she's taking this anti-nausea medication. She has late-stage terminal uh, cervical cancer. So, uh, so you know, that checks out a little yeah. bit. So I, I, I interrupted you about the aluminum casket, and so, you, like, you, you moved on from that, but, like, was that supposed to... Is that supposed to, like, seal in whatever... Yeah, Does aluminum that, have any special properties? Was... Also, UK listeners, aluminium. But uh Yeah. You had no idea what we right. were talking about. You probably about couldn't there. even know. Yeah. You were just like, what <laughs> in the world? What are they talking about? No, they don't have any like aluminium. Yeah. He said that. <laughs> yeah. Uh so yeah, is that like is that does that have a chemical property of like stopping toxins or what? Are they just like trying everything? I I honestly don't know, but I assume so yeah. because it's like, I guess they just don't want to put the body with other bodies yeah. in, yeah. you know? So just in case, like, I don't know, because they don't know what's going on. With right. It. So uh, the, uh, the associate deputy director of the Forensic Science Center <clears throat> found that Gloria Ramirez had dimethyl sulfone in her blood and tissues which is a thing that occurs naturally in the body and it breaks down certain things it's a complex thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of like appears in the body breaks down what it needs to and that disappears within three days yeah but she had way too much Ooh. of this uh dimethyl sulfone in her body so much she had a cell phone that in her body. 
Yeah. Sue that doctor. It was six. <laughs> what? What? What the fuck did you say? <laughs> I said, you need to sue that doctor if she got a cell phone in her body. You know what? Yeah. Surgery. Uh, sometimes you make a mistake. Uh, don't sue the doctor. <laughs> Come on. Give him a break. Uh, but she had way too much. So much so that it was still three times as much as she should have had six weeks after she died. Whoa. It's supposed to disappear within three days of occurring. Yeah. So it's six weeks later, so that, she has three times the normal amount that she would have at any given so time. So the half-life is like, well, I mean, it comes out like three days. So she had like multiple times more at the time of her death. Yeah, must have. Wow. For sure. Okay. They theorized that she was using DMSO, with which is dimethyl sulfoxide, <laughs> which is an... As an anti-inflammatory gel. And she covered the majority of her body with that to combat pain that was caused by the cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. That would explain the oily sheen on her body. And uh, it would also explain the fruity garlic smell coming from her mouth, apparently. Yeah. Uh, It's related to that. So... um, but, again, that's a theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also believe the paramedics gave her uh, an oxygen mask on the way to the hospital, mm-hmm. uh, which then, mixed with the DMSO, caused an oversaturation of that chemical and caused it to crystallize and become the particles that were visible in her Oh, blood. whoa. Chemistry is crazy. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then the final thing that they, the uh, Forensic Science Center, theorized, which in this final theory, this is not tested in any way. Mm-hmm. This is legit just a theory. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other things were like uh, actually put to the right. test and they're like, this is our best guess yeah. and here's some evidence. Uh, so this is just a theory. Uh that the defibrillator's electric shocks caused the dimethyl cell phone, the cell phone that's within her body that has AT and T, to mix with other sulfate, naturally occurring in Gloria's body, and it end up generating dimethyl sulfate, which is a dangerous chemical that can cause paralysis, oh. delirium convulsion yeah and damage to the heart liver kidneys and central nervous system so they amplified they they so so pretty much the 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 hospital all all medical staff involved dropped the ball on this because the emts gave her the oxygen that crystallized some of this compound and then the treating like the in the er the treating uh physicians put on these elect- electrodes and the current caused it to become like react and also become airborne. Yeah. And become a, become more, more dangerous. dangerous yeah, chemical, yeah, yeah. Uh, that affected people. But so that, yeah, just don't go to doctors. Other... Never go to a doctor. That's what I'm, that's Never what I'm taking away from this. Don't breathe oxygen Buy and leeches. let your heart stop. By leeches. <laughs> They're the answer for everything medical. Um, you heard it here first, folks. But many other scientists uh, chimed in uh, to say that last part, that last theory with the defibrillator, mm-hmm. uh, was an impossibility, mm-hmm. like scientifically. Mm-hmm. But this is the conclusion that the Forensic Science Center came to. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, also, an issue with the theory is that uh, industrial workers who have been exposed to that last chemical mentioned, uh, dimethyl sulfate, mm-hmm. uh, they didn't have the same symptoms mm. as hospital staff. Mm-hmm. The first, uh, the most likely symptom that would appear to a person that was exposed to that would be crying like they got tear gassed. Oh. Uh, 
and it would have taken longer to appear. Um, so, but the coroner's office went, said, no, nah, this is what, this is the theory we're going with. Um, Glor Gloria Ramirez's family said she didn't use DMSO. So, she was DMSO was the thing yeah. that was the base chemical that this whole theory is based yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, which is like a gel for anti-inflammatory anti stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, there's that. After several months, <laughs> did you have something to say? I was just going to say, like, could, did they not, like, take a sample of the stuff on her skin? Or, like... Well... I don't know what you or mean. Or did they, like the oily That's... stuff, or did they? Yeah. And then the doc, the family saying like, no, she didn't use that. But they're like, all right, but it's on her. Yeah. Okay. They, I mean, they're saying they did. Oh, uh, yeah. And they're saying. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's what happened. Gotcha. Um, or it's not like that they, that's what it was. It was like they detected the initial, uh, chemical in her body gotcha. dimethyl sulfone mm -hmm. and they're like what is what could possibly why would this be here and that's the only thing they could think of basically uh and then they just went on with that theory to another theory that expanded and tried to so the base theory things. that was expanded upon okay yeah okay uh after several months, the county's investigation concluded that... So, that was the coroner's office. Now, it's the county's investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they concluded that uh, too much stress and a group reaction to a strange odor caused the strange symptoms mass hysteria style. Whoa! All right. Yeah, I like that theory. The hospital staff member that suffered bone necrosis was like, hey, like, <laughs> mass hysteria doesn't cause doesn't bone call, necrosis. But yeah, my bones are rot. <laughs> Fuck You're you. You're like, it's not like it's all in my head like I passed out and feel sick. My bones are rotting in my knees. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. mm, well, you shouldn't overreact so much. And... They filed a lawsuit. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm not going into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but choo, that choo. did happen. Law and order. Um, so, uh, in April 12th, 1994, county officials announced Glory Ramirez died of heart failure due to kidney failure, which was due to her late stage cervical cancer that she was diagnosed with six weeks before her death mm -hmm. so uh the various substances in her blood weren't enough to explain the death itself yeah it was uh two months uh after the her death that county officials released her body so that gloria ramirez could have a proper funeral mm -hmm. according to them it took so long because they were worried that they didn't want to give a body that had toxic elements. Yeah. You know. So that's why it took so long. Uh, Gloria Ramirez's family were not happy with the hospital or the county. Mm. Her sister specifically blamed bad conditions at the hospital for her death. Whoa. All right. That's the county. What? That seems like a reach. I mean, obviously something unexplainable or I mean, not at the time understood, but like had happened. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just like the best case to make at the time. I don't know. The county said their investigation looked at the hospital's conditions and said that that did not factor into her death. Previously, there have been noted issues with this hospital. 
including the hospital being cited in 1991 for having a possible leak of hazardous gas from a sterilizer. Oh. In 1992, the hospital was notified that there was algae growing in one of their water re reservoirs. And uh, finally, the other notable thing, another time, the California Occupational Safety and Health Administration reported that the emergency room was permeated with sewer gas Ugh. from a drain in 1993. All right, maybe she has a good case. <laughs> <laughs> I rescind my argument. Yeah. So, it's... <laughs> you, you, I, I, you know, at first glance, you're like, well, yeah, maybe not. That's pretty but extreme with stuff. Sewer gas yeah. in the emergency room. That's the the least um, fun gas. Yeah. Uh, the coroner claimed initially, uh, this is to go towards uh, the family's perspective, mm -hmm. uh, their case. The coroner claimed initially after the first autopsy that it was not natural causes that caused her death. But then later was like, nah, it was. It was natural mm -hmm. causes. It was the heart failure, kidney failure due to cervical cancer. Looking after themselves. Mayhaps. Also, 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 also uh, Stephanie Albright, an investigator from the coroner's office that was on the case, committed suicide one month into the investigation. According to the coroner who performed Gloria's autopsy, she had been under a lot of pressure due to this case. Oh. That's just that's, a weird... Yeah, uh, that's like a sad addition that like makes it like not to, to exploit the, the death, but like it makes it more mysterious. Yeah. Uh, I mean... There was a lot of tension on this case. Yeah. So. I mean, it, that seems yeah. to indicate. I mean, I, w I won't say it indicates guilt because it could it could just be like she's afraid of like her reputation being tarnished. But yeah, there's yeah, like a be, lot of. It could be whatever. It's just yeah. like it indicates probably something. Yeah. At something. All. <laughs> yeah. Even if it was like you a know. mistake or like or even if she was just like. Maybe she's just very particular about her work, and she's like, they're going to find this, and it's going to be like unreasonable standard that she's holding herself to. Yeah, yeah, that's sad. Another thing is the syringe that they got Gloria Ramirez's blood uh, from, mm -hmm. that the blood was in, it was just thrown away accidentally. Of course. So, uh... Lori Ramirez's family filed a malpractice and wrongful death lawsuit against Riverside County. And uh, so, yeah, another theory, this is the last theory, uh, that the New, the New Times LA uh, published in 97, so this is uh, a few years, years later, ago. was that members of the hospital staff were smuggling methylamine, which was used to make meth. Yeah. In IV bags, and one of the tampered IVs was accidentally used on Gloria oh. Ramirez, which caused her death and the staff getting fucked up. Yeah. Uh, Livermore Labs, uh, one of the forensics labs that was used to investigate this in general, found an abnormal amount of nico nicotinity or whatever. Yeah. Nic nicotin amide mm -hmm. that's what it is in gloria's system and that is a type of vitamin that is used to mix with illegal drugs because it adds to the euphoric effects uh. and the last thing that supports that theory is that riverside county is america's biggest drug trafficking distribution center mm. yeah I'm going to go with that. That's what I believe. Yeah. I I think that's a very interesting theory, <laughs> but I don't know that I buy yeah. it. Um, it's outside the I, box. I kind of think, yeah. I kind of think it's, 
I I don't know what the answer is to like exactly what happened, but I personally believe that uh, the the county and the hospital are trying to cover up their fuck ups. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Regardless of how it came about, it was like or like what exactly those were. And I yeah. I I have my doubts of uh her actual toxicity. Yeah. As a woman. Mm, okay. Like obviously something right, caused right. these effects. Yeah. But they you know, the news stories were like this is a woman, she's a fucking mutant right, that causes yeah. people to it's melt around sensationalized, her. yeah. Yeah. Uh but yeah. That is the story of Gloria Ramirez, the toxic. Pretty lady. weird story. So, yeah, that's a that's a pretty bizarre one. Yeah, you hadn't heard of that one before. I I had heard of the like some of the smell and stuff, but I hadn't. I, maybe it was like a long time ago because I I didn't. I have not heard any of the theories and stuff. I'd only heard of it as like a, a medical mystery sort of thing. Um, I had not heard any of the potential explanations for it, and I didn't. It's I, I, I I'm only remembering bits and pieces. I remember the smell, the oily sheen, and some people getting sick. But that's yeah, that's yeah, that's like the focus of most yeah. of the intrigue about yeah. it. But to me, the intrigue is. I mean, that is the yeah, intrigue, but all the possible explanations I... are also equally intriguing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's what I heard about it, and then when I looked into it, I was like, "Oh, it's probably to me." Yeah. I'm like, "It's probably the corruption of the county and the hospital." Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I can't be positive. I think I heard it. I saw this on an episode of Bedtime Stories, it's a YouTube channel. Um, mm. but I can't I can't be positive. But that seems like something. If if I heard of it, that's where I heard of it. Word. Yeah. Uh, and do you recommend that? I do recommend that channel. It's all, some of it's like paranormal stuff, but some of it's just like weird deaths and things like this. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're going to post this yeah. because we don't have a alternative in mind. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to post this in a poll and because we want to hear what you think. Which story was weird? Yeah. Was it, uh, what is it? What are you going to call well, it? The terminal I was going to say man? the terminal man. Like, I don't have like the copyright laws on this stuff, but, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the can, Terminal Man. Yeah. The Terminal Man versus the Toxic Lady. That's a good one. Works perfectly. Uh, uh, so the poll's going to be up, and uh, then uh, you guys vote on which story is weirder. Eventually, that will lead to one of us forcing the other to ingest a weird piece of media. Uh, Might be an opera. And uh, Never know. I, I pray it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I... I I can't follow opera yeah. most of the no, time. I've it's got in a couple things. Uh, I've got a list going, so that might be on the list somewhere. But uh, no, I got I got something else in mind for you. Yeah, yeah, uh, and they might have already heard it. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> but because we're recording in advance. Anyway, uh, that's our show. It's a good one, I think. Yeah, that was a really good one. And. Uh, Thank you for listening. If you want to contact us, we're at War of the Weirds on Twitter. Uh, I'm Broomy Tunes on Twitter. Uh, Mystic, Mystic Monkey X. Is there an underscore? Uh, I don't think so on Twitter. Not on Twitter. There might be. But there I don't you know. go. I don't, I don't, <laughs> Figure not... it out, folks Just, at home. Yeah, you make an effort. <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> uh, you can also contact us at War of the Weirds at gmail.com. Uh, with any mm-hmm. weird tales, any suggestions for stories to cover, any suggestions for possible weird or horrible pieces of media that we should make the other consume, or maybe we could like if it's something, maybe we could both do it and then do an episode about it. Who knows? Um, I'll say yeah. a special thank you to our sponsor, and uh, yeah, thank you so I, much. I, also, uh, also, also, uh, I would like to say. Uh, I forgot what I would like to say. All right. Well, he would like to say something, but he's not gonna. I refuse. Uh, uh, and was... that's where we'll end. Uh, and we'll see you 
on the next one.